I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Donald J. Trump, the revelations in the New York Times in these last days about taxes and Donald J. Trump. As I understand it, and it is challenging to solve this, at some point in the 1990s, Congress passed legislation that permitted developers, builders such as Mr. Trump, to use the losses that they've incurred in enterprises to use those losses on their personal income taxes so that, and the law's now been changed, so it, I'm speaking in time, so that you could deduct your losses over many years, up to 20 years, this year, last year, and 15 or 16 years going forward. That is what the apparent revelation in the New York Times pointed to. In the second debate, there was an instance where Donald J. Trump was asked or it was suggested that he didn't pay federal income tax. And I believe at some point he certainly let us understand that that was accurate. John Tamney, writing for Ruchler Markets, where he is an editor as well as at Forbes, looks to Trump's tax question and asks the extremely important question to all of us. Is there anybody in America who pays more taxes to the federal government than he or she owes? John, a very good evening to you. If we go along with the presumption that Mr. Trump's accountant pointed out to him that he had an advantage with all of these losses going forward, if he was to ever earn money ever again, of $916 million, if that is all accurate, and Mr. Trump seemed to indicate it is, Is that a crime, John? Is that even unethical? Is there something unpatriotic about that? Good evening to you. Hey, John. Well, it's certainly not a crime. And the bigger thing is, is it's certainly not not patriotic. When people give more than they owe to the federal government, they're not helping everyone. They're hurting everyone because extra revenues causes government to grow. It's that simple. Uh, my one of the examples that I used in the column was Medicare. Thanks to a surge in revenues in 1965, Medicare was funded. The so three billion dollar program is ex- it was expected to cost 100 or was expected to cost 12 billion by 1990. It cost 110 billion. Medicare is expected to cost taxpayers one trillion by the year 2020. So when government collects revenues, the tax that is government grows and grows simply because politicians devise new ways, new programs to start that only expand because they develop political constituencies. Any time people can limit their tax bills, everyone is much better off. There was a time, and you point to Larry Kudlow and Brian Dimitrovic's new book, JFK and the Reagan Revolution. There was a time when the top tax rate uh, in the United States of America, I know everybody's going to find this hard to believe, was 91 percent. And that wasn't I was alive when that happened. I was young, but I was alive. Eisenhower into the Kennedy years, early Johnson years, in fact, until they passed a reform act. Ninety one percent. Now, uh, my understanding is nobody paid ninety one percent. What that did is it encouraged people to use their money, especially people with lots of money, use their money in creative ways that avoided having to pay ninety one percent. But they couldn't put it directly to work. John, If that 91 percent, and we know it eventually was lowered, if that 91 percent had been 29 percent or 39 percent, what would that extra without penalties? What would that extra money have done for America at the time, John, if it were just being hypothetical here? Oh, it would have done enormous things. Because think about what happens when the super rich don't pay taxes. Let's just assume for a second that Donald Trump makes 100 million dollars a year. He says he earns a lot more. Assuming he pays nothing on it, let's say he puts it all in the bank. Okay, beautiful. Banks aren't paying him for his deposits so they can stare lovingly at his dollars. They're paying him for them so that they can uh, lend to people who have car loans needs, vacation loan needs, who, who want a loan to go to college or a loan for a small business. If he puts it in the stock market because he's more aggressive, his money is being redistributed to companies that need capital in order to grow, in order to build factories, hire people, invest in R&D. 
What if he puts it in, in a private equity or venture capital fund? That means that Donald Trump's untaxed wealth is going toward the saving of companies that are literally going to die unless they get a capital infusion, or it's going toward a future Microsoft, Intel, or Google. When the rich get to hold on to their wealth, we get immediate access to it. It's redistributed throughout the, the economy. When governments get it, they consume it, and they direct it toward favored constituents. It's always good to limit what you hand over to the federal government. In addition, I believe it is accurate to say that when the rates were 91 percent or very high, the well-to-do found ways not to pay that tax, but it didn't put it directly to work, such as you just listed. They, they, they went into elaborate schemes, including keeping their money overseas or using uh, municipal bonds where you don't pay any tax. In other words, they put their money into not, uh, less than productive w- uh, avenues, whereas if you reduce the taxes on the well-to-do, they'll put it into uh, risk. They'll take ventures. They'll they'll fund the growth of business, which is good for all of us. So I go back to my original question of avoiding paying more than you owe is not only not patriotic, I believe, but it's the best thing you can do for the economy. Is that the way to argue this, John? I'm, I'm backing into this, but I'm without, trying to get to it. question. Um, an economy is just a collection of individuals. Find me an individual who is made better off if more and more of the earnings each year are being taken away in taxes. But you hit on two really important things here. Uh, The first thing is governments never raise taxes. Politicians don't raise taxes. What they do is they raise the headline rate so that they can lower it through all sorts of tax code handouts. And so politicians raise taxes just to increase their power over the economy, their power over how we do things, because they show us ways, they devise ways for us to lower the tax bill by doing what they want to do. So tax increases hand power over the federal government, but in ways that we haven't really thought about. But the second and the bigger point you're talking about is when people get to keep more of their money, they can take risks with it. If you if you if you've got a hundred million dollars untaxed versus ten million, you can take risks on some exciting companies because you've got so much money you're willing to, to lose some of it on interesting ideas. When government successfully taxes away wealth, what it does is it robs the country of, of necessary and vital entrepreneurialism that powers the economy forward. A tax on wealth is a tax on jobs and interesting companies that hurts all of us. Let's turn to a company that's much in the news these days for its misbehavior. This is Wells Fargo, a bank, where, where the money is, the banks. As I understand it, what Wells Fargo has done is, is fired 5,300 employees for their misconduct. Uh, and this included opening up fake account, fake credit cards for customers that never use them. There's the suggestion by Congress, John, and you've seen these quotes, that there's criminal behavior at Wells Fargo. I have not seen an arrest yet. Will there be an arrest, John? What, what, is, what is it that Wells Fargo has done that deserves jail time? Uh, if you think responding to incentives, if you think responding to incentives that reward you for selling more of your company's product to willing customers is jailable, then you think these should, people should go to jail. What we're talking about is individuals who plainly were worried they were going to lose their jobs. They are in high-pressured sales jobs. That's a good thing. Um, If you succeed in that environment, you can earn a lot of money. A lot, plainly, some of these people at the bottom, some of the least productive salespeople, made up new accounts uh, so that they could show their bosses progress. They were quite simply trying to hold on to their jobs. And now Wells Fargo has paid, what, a $185 million fine. It's just tragic. Where's the crime? And the president, uh, the leader of Wells Fargo, has paid a lot of money as well in of his um, missing the misconduct in his firm. The puzzle here, John, is that there's an association with banks doing something irregular with theft. There was no theft here, correct? You At one point, you have an instance when they created a, a card, a credit card, for a customer who didn't want it, didn't use it, but there was, uh, they weren't, nobody was robbing that customer. Nobody was using the credit card to uh, buy a lot of baseball tickets. No, and it had nothing to do with theft. This was salespeople struggling to keep their jobs, 
looking and doing so by basically creating accounts that hadn't been approved by customers just to show their, their manager's progress and opening up credit cards in potential or existing customers' names. They weren't taking the credit cards out and buying things. They quite simply were desperately doing everything to hold on to their jobs. And that's what's interesting about they talk about 5,300 people fired. And they say, well, yeah, you know, so they were fired because they'd opened up these dummy accounts. More likely, most of them were fired simply because they didn't meet a sales quota. Politicians want high-paying jobs, at high, good jobs at good wages, but they don't realize the pa- fastest way to a good job is doing well in sales. That's the fastest way to high pay. But some aren't going to cut it, and some who aren't cutting it are going to cut corners just trying to stay employed. The only people group hurt by this was Wells Fargo because their reputation took a hit. And will continue to be hurt by it until they correct the record. So they have shareholders, and the shareholders will hold the leadership accountable for the misconduct. It's not a criminal behavior. John Tamney for Real Clear Markets. When we come back, free trade, not in the second debate, more is the pity, but it is in the conversation these days. Those who speak against free trade, those who speak against globalization, speak against America's prosperity. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Temp, writing at Forbes most recently. He's an editor at, at Real Clear Markets, as well as a senior economic advisor to Toreador Research and Trading. But right now, he's writing at Forbes, where he's the political economy editor. John, as I understand it, free trade is part of the background of the present 2016 election. And Donald J. Trump has a position which you'd have to say is creatively anti-trade. In some fashion, I can't define it other than to say there are remarks that uh, find free trade not successful, according to the Trump campaign. And Hillary Clinton is hardly a a paragon of free trading, but at least right now, she's not speaking in a way that would disrupt my understanding of our prosperity trading with Mexico and Canada and other states. However, you point out that there are pundits— who are now writing against free trade as if it was invented by certain departments of economics that live in Chicago, Illinois. What's happened, John? Is there a revolt of the commentariat against free trade? Yeah, there's a revolt among certain members of the commentariat. They say that what has always been good for the people who comprise an economy isn't as good today. And their argument is this. Other people in other countries of the world have really lately been developing their strengths such that they're much more competitive. Well, think about that. What they're saying is that free trade for the U.S. is better than it's ever been. Because why do we get up and produce every day? Why do we get up and go to work? We go to work to get all that we don't have. And so post-World War II, when much of the world's economy was on on its back, meant that Americans worked only to have very little of the world working to serve its needs. Now we've got a much more advanced global economy full of people fighting feverishly every day to give us bargains, to expand the value of our paychecks. It's never better than the present to to be an American worker, and it's never better to be a free trader, yet yet people and the pundits are saying it's a bad thing for us. An economy is a collection of individuals. How does that help us explain why how Hazlitt is, is wrong? Well, what Hazlitt was saying was something incredibly profound. He was saying that what is, uh, what is unfortunate for an individual must be equally unfortunate for the individuals who comprise an economy. And so you think about free trade, how does it hurt an individual, and that's all the U.S. economy is, is a collection of individuals, if you have not just the people in your city, state, or country lining up to serve you, but you have the most talented people on earth fighting, competing to serve your needs. 
So when you break this down to the individual, you can see why free trade is always and everywhere good for us. But even that doesn't get to the true beauty of free trade. What makes it just unrelentingly spectacular is that it maximizes the possibility that we individuals will get to do the work that most elevates our individual talents. When we can import from everyone else all the things that we're not so good at making, all the goods and services we need that we're not good at, we can focus on the work that we do best, and we're a lot more productive as a result. The punditry going against the grain of free trade, they have it completely backwards. And I misspoke. How Hazlitt is right is what I meant to say. This is the quote that John uses from Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. What is harmful or disastrous to an individual must be equally harmful or disastrous to the collection of individuals that make up a nation. That is the corrective here. So let's apply this to the present presidential campaign, which admittedly has moved away from talking about trade, but it'll come back in the 45th president. See, right now. Right now, John, free trade benefits America in all directions. Protectionism. Does that benefit America? The idea of building a wall or screening out immigrants or in some way using, I don't know, some fantastic device against China. Does that help America? No, it's it's tragic for Americans because Americans are the most productive workers on Earth. We're, the U.S. is the biggest importer of foreign goods precisely because it's the biggest producer of goods in the world. The U.S. is the biggest exporter of, of goods and services and that's why it's the biggest importer. So if you put tariffs on foreign goods, you're taxing the reason that Americans get up and go to work in the first place. Suddenly their work is being taxed at a much higher rate. So it's bad there. But remember, if we can't import, if we can't buy from people around the world, by definition, we can't sell to people around the world. And so to put up tariffs is to, as a rule, shrink global markets for U.S. producers. Well, think about that. We've got Apple, we've got Intel, we've got Microsoft. We've got the most valuable companies on Earth who have become valuable precisely because they serve the global economy. This would be terrible for our best companies. And therefore, John, I, I want to I be very careful here. The idea that we need to produce everything here for ourselves and not have it produced overseas where the, where the costs are lower... The idea that we produce it here, doesn't that make us poor? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? If that, because that means we're not importing, we're not exporting, we're just, we're an island. And that's a oh. poor island. A very poor island. Because think of, break it once again down to the individual. I'll, I'll, let's talk about you and me. Um, I, I'm a, I think I'm a good writer and an editor. I think you're a great radio person, radio host. But what if you had to provide for the mic that you speak into? I wouldn't have time. What if you had to manufacture the computer on which you type? What if you I had to know grow how. and raise the food That's that right. you eat? I, nothing. You would be you would die unemployed, right. unfed. Just a guy so with I. a guy with a delusion. That's all I'd be. Yes. Yes. You would be yelling up at the sky with no job, soon to die, emaciated, unclothed, and unsheltered. And that describes me. But thanks to free trade, I can focus on what I think I'm really good at and leave all the other things that I need to others. I can leave it up to others around the world to compete to serve me. So does, the indiv- does, does, does free trade elevate the individual? Of course it does, in a, in a major, major way. And so as a rule, free trade elevates the U.S. economy simply because it elevates the individuals within that economy. There are no American jobs. There are jobs created by Americans because we have access to the world market and to use the world's goods here to sell back to the world. So this push for American jobs, John, do they, do, does the commentariat understand they're pushing for a bleak, a, a bleak future? Do they understand that? They plainly don't understand it because they see job creation as the purpose of an economy. No, 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 no. Attaining wealth is the purpose of an economy. If we want to create lots of jobs, let's just abolish the tractor. Because it used to be that right. one in two Americans worked on the farm. The creation of the tractor was the biggest job destroyer in the history of the United States, but did it put us in bread lines? No, it enriched us, because suddenly we didn't have to spend every hour of every day just trying to create the food in order to survive. We could leave that to others, 
producing a lot more, and then focus on work that was much more in line with our talents. And so when you can destroy unnecessary forms of work, that's what allows you to elevate your skills to a level that makes you much more productive. The U.S. is rich precisely because it's an open market to foreign goods. If we weren't, if we were protectionist, we would be poor because we would be doing unproductive, unnecessary work that could have been left to others. John Tamney at Forbes and Real Clear Markets is also the author most recently of Who Needs the Fed? What Taylor Swift, Uber, and Robots Tell Us About Money, Credit, and Why We Should Abolish America's Central Bank. With free trade, we don't need central bankers. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.